Hello everyone, welcome to the Literary and Jury Charge portion of the 140 class. We're going to start off with some congressional record and the subject is a living dream. Ready? Here we go. Mr. Speaker, for several years now, my hometown, the city of Santa Barbara, California, has been organizing and leading a campaign called A Living Dream. This campaign is aimed at encouraging and stimulating community service and pride and promoting the city's economic goals. Not surprising, the campaign is effective, exciting, and widely supported. On February 11, 2011, the citizens of Santa Barbara had the chance of a lifetime to show that actions do speak as loud as words. I am proud to report that citizens supporting a living dream were able to muster mass support and recognition when a potentially vo volatile situation developed. In a broad demonstration of community pride and unity, Santa Barbara was the scene of the dedication of the Ronald Reagan Library. During these dedication ceremonies, nearly 50 Vietnam veterans stormed on the assemblage, chanting anti-nuclear slogans, harassing the police officers, and attempting to cause total chaos and confusion. A great deal of credit goes to the chairperson of A Living Dream. Without so much as a wave of the hand, the dedication ceremonies were halted and the chairperson approached the leader of the veterans and shook his hand and thanked him for coming to the dedication ceremonies. The chairperson encouraged the veterans to join in the truly worthwhile cause of working with their adversaries rather than against them. The veterans were invited to stay for the dedication ceremonies. As you can see, the city of Santa Barbara contains some truly enlightened community leaders, a highly professional police force, and a group of caring and reasonable citizens. By positive actions, a potentially explosive situation was avoided. The city of Santa Barbara reinforced the meaning of the right to peaceful assemblage and the right to free speech. Okay. have some legal opinion. Here we go. Ready? The subject of deliberate murder and premeditated murder is interwoven into one issue. We define only murder, which is perpetrated by willful killing, a deliberate killing, or a premeditated killing, when express malice aforethought is present as murder of the first degree. The word willful means intentional. Willful is something that is said or done deliberately. A synonym for willful is voluntary. The word deliberate means formed or determined or arrived at based upon a careful process of thinking and weighing any and all considerations for and against the proposed course of action. The word premeditated means to consider beforehand any plan which is thought out, schemed, or planned before an act is premeditated. When you find that a killing was preceded and accompanied by an obvious and deliberate intent on the part of the defendant to kill, which was the result of careful deliberation and premeditation, so that the act must have been performed based upon pre-existing reflections, 
and not governed by a sudden heat of passion or other condition precluding the idea of deliberation, it is murder of the first degree. The law cannot undertake the responsibility of measuring in seconds, minutes, hours, or days the length of the period of time during which a thought must be weighed and pondered before it can mature into an actual intent to kill, which is truly deliberate and premeditated. The time will vary with different individuals and under varying circumstances. The true test is based not on the duration of time, but rather on the extent of the contemplation. A cold and calculated decision may be arrived at in a rather short period of time, but a rash and impulsive act, even though it includes the intent to kill, does not require such deliberation and premeditation as defined by law as an unlawful killing in the murder of the first degree. Any opinion is subject to interpretation and consideration because all situations will vary according to the surrounding circumstances. In order to constitute a deliberate, premeditated killing, the question of killing must be weighed and considered, and the reasons for and against such a choice must be weighed. With this in mind and knowing the consequences, my opinion is that a deliberate, premeditated killing is perpetrated when a person decides to and does kill. <clears throat> All right, moving right into some fun facts or interesting facts on food and drink. Here we go. Diamond Jim Brandy's average breakfast as recorded by a New York as a New York restaurant, a gallon of orange juice, three eggs, a quarter of a loaf of cornbread, sirloin steak with fried potatoes, grits and bacon, two muffins, and several pancakes. For dinner, Diamond Jim might eat three dozen oysters, two bowls of turtle soup, and six crabs as an appetizer. Restaurant owners refer to him as the best 25 customers they ever had. A raisin dropped in a glass of fresh champagne will bounce up and down continually from the bottom of the glass to the top. In medieval England, beer was often served with breakfast. The United States Department of Agriculture reports that the average American eats eight and a half pounds of pickles a year. Dill pickles are twice as popular and sweet, or as sweet, excuse me. Cabbage is 91% water. Lettuce is the world's most popular green. The term cocktail was invented in Elmsford, New York. A barmaid named Betsy Flanagan decorated her establishment with the tail feathers of cocks. One day, a patron asked for one of those cocktails. She served him a drink with a feather in it. Interesting. As many as 50 gallons of maple sap are needed to make a single gallon of maple sugar. Daily products account for 29% of all food consumed in the United States. The Swedes drink more coffee than any other people in the world. Potato chips were invented by a black chef in Louisiana in 1865. Goat's milk is used more widely throughout the world than cow's milk. Wine tasters never drink the wine they taste. They sip it, swish it about, gargle it, and then spit it out. Swallowing wine is believed to dull the palate, not to mention the brain. Wadakin and Matsgusa beef 
raised in Japan, are considered the two most tender kinds of beef in the world. The steers from which this meat is taken are isolated in totally dark stalls fed on beer and beer mash and hand massaged by specially trained beef massers three times a day or massers excuse me wine will spoil if exposed to light hence tinted bottles chop suey was invented in the united states its creator was a chinese dignitary visiting america in the 19th century requested by american friends to prepare an authentic chinese meal and not having the proper ingredients the chinese gentleman ordered his cook to collect all available foods pour them into a large pot and flavor the whole thing with soy sauce which was still relatively new and exotic to the Western palate. Asked the name of this delicious concoction, the dignitary, spotting a pair of chopsticks lying near the bottle of soya sauce, replied, Chop soya. Through his heavy Chinese accent, this became chop suey, and so it has remained ever since. Milk is heavier than cream. According to the Nutritional Sciences Department of Cornell University, the best temperature at which to preserve frozen foods is zero Fahrenheit or negative 18 Celsius. The purpose of the indentation at the bottom of a wine bottle is to strengthen the structure of the bottle and to trap the sediments in the wine. Vintage port takes 40 years to reach maturity. The average person ingests about one tons of food and drink each year. Wow, interesting facts. Messers. Interesting facts. All right. I'm going to continue on uh, with opening statements that we started in the last class. Okay, ready? This is going to be a time when the judge is going to allow you to take a few minute to take a few minute break, your morning break. Excuse me. After you return, we will then tell you about what evidence it is that the state intends to show and why it is that the state intends to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that man, Tyler Melvin, excuse me, committed the crimes of first degree intentional homicide, mutilation, and sexual assault. So if we may judge, take a 10 or 15 minute break at this time and when you come back, I will conclude my opening statement. Thank you very much. The screens have now been fixed. The reason we are here is for Tyler Melvin. We are here for the jury to consider Tyler Melvin's behavior or whether or not he participated in criminal behavior. The judge instructed you that you are going to be able to take notes during the testimony in this case, during the presentation of the evidence. Now, as you take notes, it oftentimes is a suggestion from the lawyers, from Mr. Freeman or Mr. Edger, whoever is giving their opening statement may have suggestions for you as well. But in note taking, in taking detailed notes, which you are going to be able to use during your deliberations, the two questions at least that the state is going to ask or present evidence that is going to ask you to answer are these. Number one, was he there? And number two, did he help? Was he there? And did he help? 
On November 6, Tyler Melvin, right after this case began, right after the investigation in this case, denied any knowledge of McKenna Frank's death. Oh, he did indicate some version that he had seen his Uncle John talking with McKenna, but the investigators pretty much disregarded that because it wasn't consistent and it didn't fit with the timeline. It didn't fit with the evidence. Remember, McKenna got there at about 2.40. You are going to hear evidence that Tyler didn't get off the bus from school until 3.45, a full hour after that meeting, after McKenna would have been talking out on the porch with Mr. Smith and so Tyler was nowhere on the radar screen. He was nowhere as a suspect. He was just a witness, like any other witness, who might have been on the property. That tends to change on February 27, when Tyler starts giving new details. He is re-interviewed based upon some other information that was obtained by Mr. Fass and Mr. Wilbert, and he then becomes a much more important witness. He is now a witness at this point. He says that he sees John standing near the fire. He sees body parts of McKenna Frank in the fire. He puts, he helps put fuel on the fire to help kind of stoke up the fire, if you will. Uncle John makes some admissions that Uncle John stabbed McKenna Frank, but also that Mr. Melvin saw some clothing. And interestingly, he said he saw McKenna's clothing in a bag, and he saw them in a bag in the garage. Well, as officers, you will learn, kind of reconstructed that February 27 statement. They started saying, as investigators do, well, wait a second, that can't happen that way. How can he describe McKenna Frank's clothing if they are in a bag? In the forensic interviews, you will hear, you will hear testimony from investigator Mark Willow. Witnesses give interviews and forensic interviewing you will hear some version of what's called the funnel technique. Okay. I'm going to continue on uh, with uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Here we go. I drop my eyes, kneading the dying flesh of his feet between my fingers. For a moment I felt afraid, as if accepting his words would somehow betray my own father. But when I looked up, I saw Maury smiling through tears, and I knew there was no betrayal in a moment like this. All I was afraid of was saying goodbye. Maury wanted to be cre cremated the rabbi, a longtime friend whom they chose to conduct the funeral service, had come to visit Maury, and Maury told him of his cremation plans. The rabbi was stunned, but Maury was able to joke about his body now. The closer he got to the end, the more he saw it as a mere shell, a container of the soul. It was withering to useless skin and bones anyhow, which made it easier to let go. We are so afraid of the sight of death, Maury told me when I sat down. I adjusted the microphone on his collar, but it kept flopping over. Maury coughed. He was coughing all the time now. I read a book the other day. It said... As soon as someone dies in a hospital, they pull the sheets up over their head and they wheel the body to some chute and push it down. They can't wait to get it out of their sight. P 
People act as if death is contagious. Last night I had a terrible spell. It went on for hours, and I really wasn't sure I was going to make it. No breath, no end to the choking. At one point I started to get dizzy, and then I felt a certain peace. I felt that I was ready to go. His eyes widened. Mitch, it was almost or a most incredible feeling, the sensation of accepting what was happening, being at peace. I was thinking about a dream I had last week where I was crossing a bridge into something unknown, being ready to move on to whatever is next. That is what we are all looking for, a certain peace with the idea of dying. If we know in the end that we can ultimately have that peace with dying, then we can finally do the really hard thing, make peace with living. It is natural to die. The fact that we make such a big hullabaloo over it is all because we don't see ourselves as part of nature. We think because we're human, we're something above nature. We are not. Everything that gets born dies. Do you accept that? All right, he whispered. Now here is the payoff. Here is how we are different from these wonderful plants and animals. As long as we can love each other and remember the feeling of love we had, we can die without ever really going away. All the love you created is still there. All the memories are still there. You live on and in the hearts of everyone you have touched and nurtured while you were here. All right, that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 140 class. Thank you.